preseason games don't count, but they absolutely matter. And for these handful of players, they're going to matter even more starting this week with the Cincinnati Bengals. Plus, the Packers' defense, it sounds like, it seems like, the players and the coaches are telling us it's going to change. Will it? All of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers, your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers your first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. I am extremely excited to talk about preseason football. That's how long it's been. That's how long it's been since we have had actual football to talk about on this show. Going back to January, we're now in August, and so... That means it has been more than half a year since we've had actual football to talk about. That will not be true starting this week. Starting, well, a week from today, we will have nothing but actual football to talk about until 2024. God bless us, everyone. And for some, for some players, it's going to mean more than others. The list of players for whom it matters most to me is not the guy who is on the end of the roster who might make it with a good preseason. Not really. It is the player who has an opportunity to win a meaningful role. To me, those are the things that I am most interested in. Who has a chance? Who has the chance to go out and be more than just a special teamer. The difference between being a core special teamer and, say, a starter. And there aren't that many of those players because there aren't that many of those spots actually up for grabs. That makes this week really important for Jonathan Owens because the Packers brought in a handful of players at that position this offseason. You bring in Tarverius Moore. You have Rudy Ford, who they brought in last year, but didn't really get the opportunity to earn a starting job. Darnell Savage gets benched. Rudy Ford comes in. We know the machinations there. Adrian Amos now in New York. And so now you have this group of players, Anthony Johnson Jr., the the rookie seventh round pick in that mix as well. And so someone's got to win that job. It looks like right now the Packers are not thrilled with what Rudy Ford has been doing. Although that first unofficial depth chart that comes out, Rudy Ford is the starter at safety, at least for now. We're going to talk about some of the things that stand out uh, there at the end of the show. But Jonathan Owens is a player who is clearly playing his way into a meaningful role for the Green Bay Packers. And if he doesn't start, you have to think that in those three safety nickel looks, he's going to be that guy Rudy Ford, to me, makes sense as that nickel safety, that third, when they want to go to a big nickel look because he can play in the box, he can play deep, he can do some different kinds of things. And Jonathan Owens can do that too. He's short, but not small. And all of those guys are hyper-athletic. Darnell Savage, Rudy Ford, and, and John Owens are all guys who are, you know, nine-plus kind of, relative athletic score type players, or at least have that type of speed. And so when you have an opportunity to go win a starting job, I think you have to be on this list. I don't know how many other players truly qualify as having a chance to go win a job. It seems like Luke Musgrave is pretty entrenched as that starting tight end. 
it seems like right now, Zach Tom is pretty entrenched at that starting right tackle spot. Josh Myers, for some of the questions that we have about it, at least for the moment, is pretty entrenched. And you you probably don't want to move Zach Tom from right tackle. Although, as I've said before, every dares will remember this, that if you think the gap between Zach Tom and Josh Myers at center is greater than the gap between Zach Tom and Yash Nyman at right tackle, then maybe you make that move. I don't know where that is right now. There just aren't that many jobs actually up for grabs right now with the Green Bay Packers. Now I think wide receiver three is an interesting one. Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs are your no doubt top two outside receivers. And on the first Jep chart, you get Samori Toure as that wide receiver three. But if you're going to play in a three receiver set, one of those guys is going to be in the slot. And Samori Toure is not the same kind of slot player that Jaden Reed is. Jaden Reed is a more traditional kind of uh, quick as a hiccup kind of slot player. Luke Musgrave, He's going to get a lot of opportunities as a power slot. But if you're in that three receiver set, you're going to have someone else probably in the slot there, just given the way that this all shakes out. So unless you put a receiver in the backfield or something, you get a little crazy with formations here. So when they go to true 11 personnel, who's the guy? Who's the guy in the slot? It's going to be Christian Watson. It's going to be Romeo Dobbs. Who is that third guy? And while I think you can say, okay, Samori Toure is going to get plenty of opportunities. Are we sure about that? Like, are we really sure if he's not the slot, the guy that they want playing in those positions, then what is his opportunity? What is his market share going to look like? And then the question becomes, okay, who's wide receiver five, Dontavian Wicks, Bo Melton, Grant DuBose. Those are interesting conversations if you're really into the rookie class, if you're really into the draft like I am, if you're a football sicko like I am. But they don't really affect winning and losing. And so right now, you know, I wanted to include Lucas Van Ness on this list. I don't know, seems pretty entrenched right now that he's going to be the third edge guy on this team. Now, maybe it's a situation where if he goes out and he just, like, he beats the crap out of guys like Jonah Williams and Orlando Brown, like if his power plays against Orlando Brown, if he can bull rush that guy, maybe you start to have a conversation. Hey, should Preston Smith be more like a situational pass rusher? Like, maybe. I don't think that's likely to, to be the case. Not just because I don't think Lucas Van Ness is probably going to do that. That's almost the, the secondary problem that I have with it. I just don't think the Packers right now are, are trying to do that. I don't think they're trying to push someone like Lucas Van Ness to be that or do that. Whereas in another situation on another team or in another season, they might be. And what you want... Although it's not going to cost him his job, it could have a material impact on the season. Someone like Anders Carlson, he's starting to put together some quality practices and you, you hope that he's able to go, okay, this is where I am. I'm, I'm figuring this out. And now I have an opportunity to go in a game situation where he, he really, I thought, stepped it up on family night in a game type atmosphere, 70,000 plus at Lambeau for a practice. Lights on, fireworks afterward and you're drilling 50 yarders like it's nothing. And then you have another nice little practice. Things start moving in your direction. Okay, can you build on that? Can you go, actually, this is who I am now. That would be impactful for the Packers season. I'm not gonna win them the job, he's already got the job. So those are some of the names of the players that I have eyes on in terms of who benefits the most and then there's the list of guys that you're just really excited to see. Lucas Van Ness. Uh, the whole rookie class, but of, of the non-rookies, Devontae Wyatt, go out and kick some real ass. Go beat someone that doesn't play for the Packers. Beat the crap out of them. Go do that. 
Really excited to see that. Zach Tom go up against Trey Hendrickson and, and Sam Hubbard and some of these other guys. In, in joint practices, not just the games. So there are, there are, there's plenty at stake here. Remember, I am, I am resolute in this. The preseason games don't count. That doesn't mean they don't matter. I want to talk about this defense in just a second here on Locked on Packers because it's being billed as new, as aggressive. So what exactly does that mean? August is here and you know what that means. The official start of Fantasy Football Drafting Month. Get championship ready for your home league by trying out best ball at Underdog Fantasy. All you have to do is one live snake draft. No waivers, no trades. Underdog sets your best lineup every week. Try it out with Underdog's Best Ball Mania Tournament. The largest fantasy football contest of all time is back and even bigger with $15 million of total prizes up for grabs, including an absurd $3 million for the winner. Last year, the winner drafted their team in July. Last time I checked, it's August. So don't wait around. Visit underdogfantasy.com to find them or find them on the App Store and sign up with the promo code locked on to get your first deposit doubled up to $100. That's promo code locked on. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Coming up tomorrow, joint practices. This is a huge day for the baby Packers. We have all of the intel, the inside info. Our pal Jake Lisko from Locked On Bengals is going to be there to provide us a little, a little football guy nuance um, and, and relay some information that he's getting from those practices. All of that coming up tomorrow unlocked on Packers. Rob Domofsky wrote this great piece in ESPN about aggressiveness. And I really like how he started the, the, the story of talking about Brian Flores. Aggressiveness. And, and all of these, these defensive coordinators, there's a running back, for those of you who listen to the Solid Verbal, uh, our, pal, our pals Dan and Ty over there at the Solid Verbal, um, they... It's a bit for them. The, the attacking the attacking mindset. The new defensive coordinator always wants to come in and bring an attacking mindset. This is, this is like as football cliche as football cliche gets. And for a lot of teams, that would mean blitzing more. But the Packers already had a top blitz rate in the first half of last season. They actually blitzed less down the stretch. For the Packers, aggressiveness is not about blitzing. Although I do think some of the games that they run up front, some of the pre-snap alignment, that stuff, there is an aggressiveness in your mindset, in the tone that you set. For the Packers, it's about alignment. It's about coverage decisions. It's about playing more press and more man. And there's a couple things in this story that I thought were totally fascinating. One of them was that Joe Barry, after exit interviews, got his guys together and said, look, I know what you guys want. I heard you at exit interviews. I'm going to take your ideas because it seems like the secondary all had similar ideas about what they wanted. I'm going to take them to Matt LaFleur. And Matt LaFleur was receptive about it. And... To date, apparently, the players feel like their their you know their voice has been heard, which I think is great. They want to play more man. They want to play more press. Now, what I find interesting about this is if you go back to 2021, when Jair Alexander is hurt, Jair Alexander can press, but he he's also a terrific off corner, terrific zone corner. He's a great read and react corner. He's got the hips. He's got the speed. He can play man all day. He can play any kind of coverage you want him to play. But his read and react, his speed, his click and close, that makes him truly, truly elite. Ball skills, all that stuff. Mentality. But they got Eric Stokes and Russell Douglas. And they were two of the best three corners in the league when they were impressed by Pro Football Focus. 
they played a decent amount of that knowing, look, we got to live and die with these guys. And what teams tend to do when they have backup corners, the easiest thing to do is to just play man. It's pretty easy to just go, you got this guy versus trying to do the communication and the chemistry, like this idea of chemistry matters for defenses too. So that leads me to question. If that's what they were doing in 2021, and by the way, it worked. The numbers across the board almost were better in 2021 than 2022, although the passing defense was a top 10 unit by DVOA in 2022. If the edict was, we want to play this off soft zone coverage, and Joe Barry has to go to Matt LaFleur to okay the players saying, we want to play more press, we want to play more man. Is it the case that all along Matt LaFleur had more influence than we realized in what was going on with this defense? And this has been my theory now going back at least a year, but but more like two since Joe Barry was hired, that the Joe Barry hire was more about having someone that he felt like could be a partner with him. That once you can't get Jim Leonard, you go, okay then if I can't get the guy who I can just trust to do the thing and be innovative and do the things that I think are, are right with defense. You could have just hired a Jiro Evero, but that's a different thing. Then I'm going to take someone that I can work with, that I'm going to work with, and try and put together a, a defense together. And Matt LaFleur has final say on that. So it's Matt LaFleur's fault? Look, I, we don't know. But right now, it doesn't matter. It, it really, really doesn't. Um, I, it, it matters in the way that it, it is important to know where to assign blame for past transgressions. transgressions. And it, when you try and use like a $3 word, not quite a $5 word, transgression is not a $5 word, but you try and use like a $3 word and you mispronounce it, it's kind of embarrassing. Because then it's like, do you really use that word? Is that a word you use in your daily life? And it's just like, silly. Um, I, <laughs> it, it does matter to me because I, I always want to be judging these coaches based on the information that we have. And we, can't, we can only judge based on the information that we have about their quality. Like it matters if we want to know how good a coach Matt LaFleur is and he spent a season with his team trying to play a style that didn't fit its players and wasn't listening to its players, Joe Barry by the end of the season was going, okay, Jerry, you guys want him, you guys want him follow Justin Jefferson? And Jerry goes, yep, I want all that smoke. I want to also address this idea that, well, then if Joe Barry is just going to do what the players want, then wh why is he coaching? Well, we can't, and I've said this before, we can't praise Sean McVay for famously being so receptive to the feedback of his players while also hating on someone like Joe Barry, who it is a confirmation of your priors to say, well, this guy sucks. And so the only way he can be good is if he listens to his players. Guess what? Not every coach listens to their players. Read the quotes about Eric Bieniemy right now in Washington. Ron Rivera is throwing Eric Bieniemy under the bus for his coaching style. Oh yeah, Jack Del Rio. You know he he really adjusts every every individual. Every individual is different, and you know this is the first time Eric Bieniemy is really in this position. So you know he'll learn. He'll learn. What? Okay, it's just not how everyone operates, and so I. I do think it is worth giving some props to Joe Barry for saying, I don't know everything. And actually that the most important thing is for my players to be confident in the scheme. We talk about this with Jordan Love. It matters for the players to be confident in the scheme. And so if you have input from your players, hey, what do you like here? What do you guys feel most comfortable doing? Do you want to play more press? Do you want to play more man coverage? We can do that. We can adjust to what we're doing so that you don't feel like we're just trying to fit a, a round peg into a square hole, square peg into a round hole, whatever it is. I, I'm not going to ding Joe Barry for that. 
Do I think that Joe Barry was the right hire when that hire was made? No. Do I get why they brought him back this year? Hmm. I kind of don't. Do I think Jim Leonard has a good chance to be the defensive coordinator of this team next year? Yeah. I do. I do. So we'll see what happens. Um, I am, I am for the moment, going to take Joe Barry and Russell Douglas, who was quoted in this, in this um, piece by Rob Domofsky a number of times. I'm going to take them at their word that the changes are being made. I will also believe it when I see it, and I will believe it when I see it over a consistent period of time. And so until we see that, I'll be wondering. I hope, I hope this is happening. And if it is, it is, I think, to me, the thing that could finally set this defense over the top, set them apart. Because they have the talent. We know they have the talent. All right, I want to finish up here with some discussions about the depth chart, unofficial depth chart here, because some things stood out to me, and I want to talk about them. Coming up on Locked on Packers. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Every day, go check me out on subtext. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to connect directly with uh, my audience, to talk to you, to communicate with you, to send you exclusive content direct to your phone, and for us to interact. You can send me texts. I'll send you texts. We'll talk. It'll be great. Subtext and Substack. Substack. The Leap.Football, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Go check it out. Jason Hirshhorn has a piece up there today. I will have, I had a piece Monday newsletter. You want to check it out? You know, I don't want to, I don't want to commit my money, my hard-earned money to this. Go check out our Monday newsletter and see if maybe it's something you could be interested in. The depth chart is, by the way, not really put together by the football staff. So reading too much into it can often be a fool's errand. I'm not going to worry about what's going on with the receiver position and Bo Melton being ahead of Jaden Reed. We, we know that's nonsense. A top 50 pick is not losing out to a guy who was picked up from the practice squad last year and whose name you have not heard if you've read every single tweet from every single beat reporter over the last you know two weeks and then back into the spring. You can't remember one Bo Melton tweet, I promise. He, he's just not ahead of Jane Reed on the depth chart. So you just like don't have to worry about stuff like that. It is interesting that they listed Kenny Clark as a defensive end. He played a decent amount of three-tech last year, but they just didn't trust TJ Slayton enough to truly play full-time nose tackle. It seems like they do now, and then they have all these other guys. Now, what's interesting is they, they got all these other guys who are three-techs. Like Devontae Wyatt is a prototypical three-tech. If Kobe Wooden and Carl Brooks play in the NFL, probably three tacks. Now, both of them played defensive end, so maybe they can play a little bit of, you know, that traditional three, four defensive end, whether it's a five tack or or some of the other shades that you can put out there and, and some of the different fronts that you're gonna put together if you're if you're Joe Barry. It's interesting to me still. That Kenny Clark, who has been a nose tackle and a really good one for a long time, is not listed at nose. I think that validates the the idea that we've been talking about on this show for a long time now, the, at least a couple of weeks. But I think longer than that, that Kenny Clark is going to be moving around more this year. That's great. Josiah DeGuar at fullback. Maybe that matters just to like nerd idiots like me who are like, if he's on the field, Luke Musgrave is at 12. Or is it 21? Is that two tight end personnel? Is that uh, two running back personnel? Josiah DeGuara is a starter. Call him whatever you want. Josiah DeGuara is a starter for the Green Bay Packers. And right now he's hurt. So it's a different thing. But he's going to be on the field a bunch. He is going to play a role much more similar to something like Kyle Juszczyk in San Francisco. And, and remember, this was something that Matt LaFleur talked about when Josiah DeGuara was drafted, that this was on the table for him. So I'm really interested to see when we actually get to see him play. Unfortunately, he's hurt right now. 
Is there someone else that they could try and slide in that role? Could you give Tucker Craft some of those opportunities while Josiah Deguara is hurt? If this is a position that you think has value in your offense and you really like where Tyler Davis is as you're sort of blocking tight end number two, this is what they did with Josiah. Is they said, look, we've got Mercedes Lewis. We've got big Bob Tunyon. We don't really have a role for you playing traditional tight end. So this is this other role we want you to try and put together. Well, if Luke Musgrave is going to run away with his tight end job and, and Tyler Davis is someone that they feel comfortable with in the running game, maybe Tucker Craft is someone who could who could just try it out. Let's just see. Let's see what you got. I mean, I, it's worth at least investigating. I frankly don't think much else is worth investigating on this roster right now in terms of the depth chart. The depth chart really does not matter right now. A lot is going to change. And what Matt LaFleur has said over and over is, I don't even want our guys looking at it. I don't want them thinking about starting. I don't want them thinking about those kinds of things. Are you on first team, second team, third team? No. Go out and do your job. That's the most important thing. And that's how you move up the depth chart is if you just go out and do your job to the best of your ability. Now, whether or not, you know, players can actually do that, that's what dictates where you are in the pecking order. First, second, third. So you have to go out and do it. Don't worry, oh, I'm listed on the second team. No. Jaden Reed is not wide receiver five or six on this team. It's just not going to happen. I, I, at this point, I would be surprised if they play the same number of games and Samori Toure has more targets than Jaden Reed. Surprised. They're putting together packages for Jaden Reed. He's getting red zone targets. Samori Toure is not. They like Samori Toure. I think he's like the new kind of Geronimo Allison kind of guy. He's going to get a lot of rotation snaps, spelling Christian Watson, spelling Romeo Dobbs. He's going to make 35 catches next year. It's going to be a nice story, but that's it. Christian Watson could be a star. Romeo Dobbs can be a really nice secondary receiver. Jaden Reed could be a terrific slot receiver. Samori Toure could be a really nice story. A really nice story. All right, back tomorrow. Joint practices are later today. A lot of fun we are going to have with that. So follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, like we went after family night, we're going to go live on Friday after the Bengals game. So you can stay Locked on Packers.